Thank you for being with us. My name is Natasha Saye, and I curate the Ann Newman Sutton Weeks Poetry Series at Westminster College. Um, please, if you're not already muted, mute your mic until after the reading. And please be aware that I am recording this session. Because of a Salt Lake County Zoo Arts and Parks grant, Westminster can invite a poet to teach semester long classes, including not only students, but by application, uh, application, adults who live in Salt Lake County and want to become better creative writers. These classes enrich the experience of both groups and they're fun to teach. This spring, Miriam Bird Greenberg is our visiting poet. Tonight, she'll read for about 20 minutes, after which we'll have a discussion or, and or Q&A of about the same length of time. If you have comments or questions, please write them in the chat so that my colleague Eileen Chansa Torres can read them and uh, invite you to elaborate if you like. Miriam Bird Greenberg grew up on a farm in Texas was educated at the University of Pittsburgh, the University of Texas, I think I have to check that, and Stanford University, and now lives in Berkeley, California. She was also a high school dropout and hitchhiker. Of that activity, she recalls, quote, cro crossing Washington State in nine rides. Six were solitary women, and each time the very act of reaching across the empty passenger seat to unlock the door for me was an act of benediction. Miriam has taught at Cornell College in Iowa and at the National University of Singapore. Her fellowships include the National Endowment for the Arts and the Provincetown Fine Arts Work Center. She's currently at work on a hybrid genre manuscript about the economic migrants and asylum seekers of Hong Kong's Chungking mansions. Miriam's poetry combines precision, lexical, historical, economic, and scientific with imagination in a rare way. Her first full length collection in the volcano's mouth is an unusually rangy book of poems poems that are so clear you can spend your energy admiring their twists and turns of phrase, their figurative language. For instance, in Spirit Level, she writes, and I cut that. <laughs> I cut my coat, quote, I am so sorry. She's also the author of two chapbooks and a letterpress artist book. Welcome, Miriam. We are so happy to have you reading tonight. Oh, thank you so much. I am so delighted to be here. Uh, I just finished teaching my poetry workshop in my intro classes tomorrow. And I really hope the students are having as much fun as I am because it's just an absolute delight. And, uh, and it really, I, I'm just really enjoying myself. Um, so thank you so much for having me, I suppose, is uh, the, the more formal more formally, I should be saying thank you so much for having me. It's an honor, but truly, it's really so much fun. Um, I'm not in Salt Lake City yet, so uh, when we, I hope that I will get to cross paths with many of you, and with luck, with luck soon. Um, I have a bunch of poems to read. Let me hit my timer so that I can keep track of keep track of the hours as they escape my grasp. Uh, so I'll be reading a few poems from In the Volcano's Mouth, and then a few more poems from some of the inchoate and continually evolving manuscripts that I persist in calling finished the moment that I've accumulated 48 poems and then, you know, 48 pages, and then spend another couple years or more working with the re recombining the golems of uh, this is the opening poem in in the volcano's mouth called would you believe and it takes place three blocks from the cypress freeway in oakland which collapsed in the 89 loma prieta earthquake there's a line in it by susan moon 
We climbed from the mouth of a volcano all year, the year I moved west with my sweetheart to live three blocks from where the earth had broken open. Men in the Acorn projects remembered pulling strangers trapped in their cars to safety. Brother, one had told me he'd said, we can be afraid of each other again tomorrow. 20 years passed, they'd made good on their promise. By then, I waited weekly in a food line alongside Chinese immigrant women who fished plastic bottles from the trash, eyes roving for a coin, a lost prize at the curb. Sometimes I'd lift my hand to the lip, look out over the volcano's rim, and there in a crevice, a scrap of paper shining, someone's private prayer or prophecy. Everybody held out hope, tended their small hustle. Women knocked on the door selling broken-heeled shoes, loquats picked in, a in an abandoned yard, would try the knob if no one was home. Could I make change for a 20? Asked someone, unfolding one she'd manufactured from a dollar bill. Would you believe what lengths I went to to call myself happy then? Star of blood that blooms beneath a bruised fingernail, star of silence left high in the heart of a room after the doors slammed. A couple sits watching one another's reflections in a mirror. The two talk like this as evening falls around them, and neither has the heart to get up and turn on the light. My body's here, but no one's in it, writes a friend. For me, it's different. I'd spent my childhood in a house made of bees. On hot days, honey dripped through cracks in the ceiling. Me, I hummed, coiled tight. It hadn't been long since I'd slept in a creosote field while grainers crashed in the switchyard nearby. Actual tumbleweeds turned like prayer wheels crossing the tracks, and the constellations coyotes called to, streaked across the night, were more miraculous than freckles on the face of God. Around then, hitchhiking past Death Valley, a pair of truckers stopped for me. I used to haul cattle to LAX, one said but I couldn't take looking into their mournful eyes anymore. I guess I wear my heart on my sleeve, he said. They were climbing through the Sierras to pick up a load of honey, telling jokes. They both had wild white beards. I hadn't yet come in my life to peer over the lip of a volcano. I wasn't yet made of cicadas, coils, and timbal. Still, I carried a bit of string, a kipu I used for eavesdropping on the passage of time. If someone had put a knife in my hands, even then, I'd have taken it. I can hear two birds quarreling, tangled in midair. I'm afraid one day I'll find myself trash picking, tearing corners from a 20. I'm afraid I'm no longer lost as the runaway I met hopping a train out of Colton that summer, who carried a small jar of her own baby teeth with her in her pack. Um, I have so much to say, and yet this poem, this is the greatest hits of this book. <laughs> this poem is called Valediction. Uh, it begins with an image from Octavio Paz's childhood that I lifted from an interview somewhere. I think, it, I, think I may have cited it in the back. Um, and, and thus, having cited, forgot. Uh, my earliest memory is aboard a train drowsing. My mother covers my eyes suddenly with her hand, startling me awake. Light spills between her fingers, then a long shadow hanging from a pole. Flag of civil wars swaying on its rope. Anyone old enough to understand grew into something like a beggar without his bowl, a thief in a country where no one's pockets sing with coins. I still can't slip out of the skin of the dead. Will I always feel washed by moonlight on a battlefield where even now the luminous effigy of war is burning? A young boy steals from the house where his family waits in darkness. A seam of light seeps from the mouth of the well, and he lifts its cover. Peering in, he finds the moon guttering on dark water. He inhales emits a dim glow as algae illumines water in the wake of a boat. Soldiers are stationed, watch-keeping along the roads of his country. 
They lie asleep as animals, bedded down at their tethers. One covers the back of his neck with his hand, as if warding away a blow in his sleep. Oh, alas, I, all, for all my talk about Hong Kong and being currently at work on something, I, it seems like I'm reading a lot of poems from the rural, the ancestral rural, and will continue. Uh, a ghost country of the erotic imagination. Oh, I wrote this long series of poems. Uh, I, I, this sort of miraculous coincidence of discovering Morris Manning's first book and going to Mardi Gras all at once. I, I wrote all of these poems about two travelers in this kind of contorted, or not contorted, mannered voice. And, uh, and then some of them came through the fire and stuck around. This is one. A ghost country of the erotic imagination. One of the travelers gets work hauling hay in the fields. Lunchtime comes and he sits sipping vinegared lemonade by a tree the plows won't come near. Rectangle of roses blooming over yonder, um, over yonder among the unharvested alfalfa where a house's foundation once stood. Across the gravel road and the rye grass, a chimney, no house, same story. He wants dusk time to come, sundown singing through the roadside's wild plum thicket till coyotes holler back in the ghost town of Macedonia. Long gone ghost First National Bank, up where the combine sits, chewing hay. The grocery a few hundred feet farther for dry goods, beans in a barrel, a meat counter with a twitchy scale and the new bolts of calico every season. He wants to wreath his head in roses and dig open the shut up wellhead. He wants to run off into the thicket and sing possum lullabies. He's drowning in a ghost river, barefoot ghost children crouching in the dirt like guinea hens with pocketfuls of marbles, pennies, mouse tails they suck on at night in secret to keep from wetting the bed. This is a, uh, a helpful tip if you have that problem. The green elm switches, their mothers make them cut when they're bad. He feels like he's drinking his father's barrel whiskey, turnip picking in the ghost economy, sleeping on a ghost cot on the slanting screened in porch, trousers threadbare, not from daydreaming. He wants love to be not a ghost muttering sweet nothing even he can't hear, but a woman drinking creek water, catching minnows barehanded. He wants to be the algae licking her ankles, the little black tongue of a leech like a fat birthmark, the sweet hum of cicadas shucking their shells in the cedar trees. Oh, it's fully autobiographical, huh? Um, landless. The dead are coming back to life. Faces painted red in the fashion of spirits, and they emerge from the woods, walking purposefully towards the far edge of the city. Two whose palms are dyed yellow with black walnut husks have stopped to adjust the pails of porcupine oranges carried between them on a pole. Another passes with a handmade chair. Quail hang in a heavy strand down their backs like a braid, a currency no one has the nerve to refuse. And when they reach the cliffs, they swan dive as though water waits below, though no dark mouth is there to briefly swallow them. Like the dead who came before, flew from burning buildings or jetliners broken open in flight by a turbulent sky, they are undressed by the air. Their clothes flutter like flags falling to the ground. In the vacant grasslands below, they squat, turning the earth with spades. They are digging night crawlers for a lark where bone gatherers once wheeled barrows of femurs bleached and shining into pyramids will dig until they hit water glistening with fish. A man combs the high weight, a man combs the waist it's high right. grass. Uh -oh. Uh, oh, maybe mute this person, David, if you don't mind. Um, a man 
combs the waist-high grass for the lost belongings of his brethren that litter the field. He stoops to retrieve a leather hat concealed by weeds, makes his hand into a soft fist, then punches the shape a body makes gently back into its crushed crown. Oh, there was a brief communique. Um, this one is among the traveler's poems. In fact, a lot of these are sort of autobiographical and landscape. A spectacular relate, let me start again, a spectacular reformation of their old ways. They've gone down to Honey Grove, are living in an abandoned house. One of them strung up a wire spliced into the electric line and the lights flicker like heat lightning all night like angels playing a trick. They have a few plates, drink from mason jar mugs. It's not for long, they know, but this is downright civilized. Breakfast at a table with bed sheets for tablecloth, a spectacular reformation of their old ways. On the falling in porch with moth shadows swimming on their faces, they wonder aloud what happened to the old white man at the Salvation Army lunch up in Idaho who could speak to space aliens. He stayed up on Blackfoot land, but spent the week in town begging day-old pastries from bakeries to dole out to the dentists who'd pro boned his gold teeth inlaid with rubies. All of this is 100% true, by the way. He told them, why didn't they settle down, get jobs at Walmart, start a family? Here's as nice a place as any, he said, handing them a sheaf of newspaper clippings, documents of his fame and fortune. They'd hung around the library all day, chasing off patrons with their unlaced shoes, souring the air, slept in a doorway and dreamt of sparkling cities. The flickering heavens reeled one innumerable self after another past their closed eyes. But lo, they never learn. At dawn again, they were cadging coffee, then kicking moss on the shoulder of the highway with their, sh with their thumbs out. But, oh, Spain, they had a book with pictures of Sevilla, the Alhambra, the Canary Islands. It was stamped Pocatello Public Library. And soon they'd lay eyes on those sparkling shores, birds yellow as the sunlight, one of them said dreamily. But no, said the other, it was dogs, loping black dogs the Spaniards had meant. And they howled their consternation like men all night at the invaders. Oh, and then finally, among these, the poem, After I Die. I am reborn as an animal that breaks into dental clinics long after sundown to suck laughing gas from its dark mask. I am reborn as an animal that keeps watch on the liquor store until the lights flick off or later. The animal that sings its ballads to the cattails, which is the same animal whose hands close over the shape of baby birds and low nests. This is an animal that carries a gold-rimmed teacup and kisses the ravenous night with all its teeth before sinking them into the leg of its benefactor. Among the cemetery with its lonesome chill, the animal made of shadow has laid down with the dead. This animal picks names from the phone book and sleeps very lightly beneath their window, awakes late for a cigarette, and its smoke drifts into their dreams. Once there was an animal just like this, who was left newly born in a box on the steps of a temple in an old country, and the priest blessed it in a bath of milk and made it jump through the fire. The animal came to glitter like pyrite, the animal shivered like gold flecking the stones of a chilly river. The animal was caused by a minor devil to stumble. And for that, it was cast off like the disheveled skin of a spirit. In slumber, the animal set out for its fortune. And in slumber came to a farm where animals were slaughtered. Needing food, he asked for a job. To pull a blade through the feathers of an animal, to pour out its blood as if from the mouth of a bottle and blanch it and put handfuls of its feathers into a bag coarsely like paper money of no remaining value. 
then cut open its small chest where the organs glisten like jewels in their shawl of blood. The animal may go on doing this forever. It may have to. The animal is accustomed to count discreetly, to curry small favor, to stop for its bottle hidden in an abandoned bunker somewhere, to drink it there in peace if it can. The animal's soul is contained in a separate vessel. Oh, so um, I could either read a couple more or I could stop there. What say regarding time? Uh-oh, you're muted. Yes. Just a couple more. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's see. Where have I where have I put these? Uh okay. So here's one. Uh occasionally People ask me what it's like to write poems about trauma. And I often say that I think my poems are actually very funny and not at all about trauma. And so with that in mind, I have a poem to read, which is called Of Addiction. <laughs> Arrow of dark that makes the world, shaft of light that opens the door to the pool halls, auto shops, the tumble down houses and small towns with one padlocked room in which the lights burn all night. The lights hum and click prelingual insect dawn, subvocalized grow up dawn, gravel popping under tires all the way to the county line dawn. The years my father stalked the house with the 22 in a mind long past drunk, threatening to kill himself until dawn. How could his children love him uncomplicatedly? If it comes to that, my mother calls to say, I will not give him my kidney, his burdens always someone else's to bear. Star flickering in the weeds, star shining in the ditch at dawn. Mornings before weddings spent soaking his grease blackened fingers in bleach, wasted at this funeral or that, the rest of his family in their well-cut clothes. In fables, the brother who'd taken the wrong path, repudiated the promised life, opens the door to the witch's house in the heart of the forest, while his companion waits outside, tending her small fire until dawn. He cinches his own belt around his arm or unscrews a bottle just to taste, although he'd sworn no more, not even yesterday ago. There are some who eat the sacred plant just because they can, others a Florence Nightingale of the junkies. If one history of womanhood is strength and resignation, what mothers never mean to teach, what my father taught me was how to be a man, playing darts all night over the stilled body of a jaguar, a Maserati, its engine extracted on the lift above as the snap-on girls brandish their hair, tawny skin glittering like a stone path in moonlight. How to stride into a room and know the answer to just about anything. I think I've actually lost the skill fully years ago. Um, charismatic and tender enough to have talked his way out of jail twice. For a while he carried a hidden Camry into, sorry, for a while he carried a hidden camera into factories behind the Iron Curtain, had stake every night and a lover in Romania who sent Christmas cards to his mother. He wore a knife in his boot, grew up in Laredo, or told these things to men in pulquerias. Drunk on mezcal in de Efe, or Schlitz at home, or moonshine, cooked half a mile up by a man who lived on our road, which the county hadn't thought to name, and rode a fence-jumping mule that stood in the ditch eating roses most days, up to its night eyes in dusty dewberry brambles. The roadsides shone with empties pitched from an idling pickup for the old men who trawled these roads to collect, as desperate people do, anywhere, in Tulsa, the Tenderloin, the Bronx, where he pressed his dungarees with a knife-edge crease every dawn before prep school. Sounds impossible that I could love him uncomplicatedly. In the hospital, more often than out, paying penance each visit to a new machine, with sinners to fill in, finding his arms, and a button to press for the opiate dream whose footprints he'd spent his whole life following. But I do love him uncomplicatedly. 
Years ago, I woke up in the woods in upstate New York, not far from the interstate. The air was cool and dim with dawn, and I walked to a diner to call home. The phone rang, my mother answered, and I told her I'd been traveling all week, had thrown off a freight train and hitchhiked east from Montana. I had one more ride to go, then a warm bed by a wood stove where I could watch meteors burn up at the edge of the sky in someone else's dawn. I heard her relay it to my father in the same far off room. We're so proud of you, he said, and she repeated it, each an echo of the other, and I could hear in their voices, warm as any home I'll ever have, that it was the truth. Oh, perhaps I have one last poem to read. Let me think on that. Oh, after all this, uh, after all this difficulty, I should read something inspirational. I, but I don't, <laughs> I don't have a single thing. Um, here, let me read then a, a brief and probably not at all heartening poem called Of the Bell's Tongue, which is after the poem Nothing Began, it is, Nothing Began As It Is by Merlin. Everything has its story. The story of the bell's tongue, which speaks all night in towns where the sky is streaked orange with the flames of a mill's furnace, is that a tool of the gods who mean for humans to believe in fate. Oh, I'm sorry, let me start over with this. The story of the bell's tongue, which speaks all night in towns where the sky is streaked orange with the flames of a mill's furnace, is that it is a tool of the gods who mean for humans to believe in fate in everything happens for a reason. When in fact, death cares nothing for the cauldron of molten metal or the orange hot cobble caught in the rollers that shoots writhing like a sea serpent to the floor, then writes in its script in loops of steel that lie radiant in the heat or lick the air of flame, dark pooling beneath the surface of its skin as it cools and the soot dark men with their faces darkened further come with a canvas stretcher on which to lay their friend. The story of two pale fingers made of silicone and lying in their cotton-lined coffin, worn like a suit bought for a godchild's naming ceremony, is no larger than the story of the lathe, which caught and kept what they replaced. The story of the San Pablito fireworks market is that no one expects it'll go up when it does, one stall after the other like a string of black cats, taking with it the vegetable sellers seated at the market's far edge and the children playing kickball in the dust widened road under their father's gaze. Its stalls burnt to matchsticks roiling with smoke and 37 vendors unaccounted for, nor does it expect, nor does anyone expect it, the time it takes only 10 and the hour before sunset when nearly everyone has gone home for the day. The story of the iron basket led by cable and pulley to cross the river after the bridge has been washed away, or to cross a river which had no bridge to begin with, is a story broken down to its most essential elements. A kid goat, if carried or tied, can fit, not its mother, unless one has been sold to the butcher or slaughtered and is brought home in pieces. I should really be off the job. I'm so sorry. Every single time I start writing, a new after a long fallow period, I think, you know, I'm really going to teach myself how to write poetry that's happy and positive. But it's and not unhappy. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think of it that way. And I'm really glad you read the two new poems, uh, uh, especially the one about your father, the addiction poem. That, that was powerful. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Um, I, I'm going to start us off selfishly uh, in the discussion or Q&A and ask you to say just a few words about your process. How, how does a poem come into words for you? How do you revise it? Oh, you know, I feel like I don't trust myself to give an answer that is even vaguely comprehensive without, you know, 12 hours. Okay. For, um, of meander. So although I think, you know, although I would tell my students and any aspiring writer that it's important to write every day and to have a consistent practice and so on, in general, I tend to write 
in these really intensive kind of manic bursts in which I, you know, I noodle around and write some terrible things and then sort of hit on something and write like 10 or 12 poems in the space of a month or three weeks, many of which are good, many of which sort of get revised into good poems, at least. And then at some point I kind of fall off the wagon and, you know, and then it all goes to hell and that's that. Um, that said, I think, so I don't think that I have any rigor at all when it comes to maintaining a consistent writing practice. And I should probably not admit this when I know that there are young and impressionable people hearing me. Um, but in terms of revision process, I had this a few years ago, maybe, well, 2014, when I wrote most of the poems in In the Volcano's Mouth, I had this dreamy residency um, and and started trying to write poems that were arranged according to some kind of associative logic. So I had been reading Ellen Bass's book um, that had just come out, which I cannot remember what it's called. Anyway, I'd been reading- mm -hmm. The Mule, the one with Mule? And... No, not the Mules of Love okay. and not the Human Line, but um, anyway, somewhere it is on the shelf in front of my face. But, uh, oh, like a beggar. Okay. Anyway, I, you know, and sometimes, sometimes some book will catch you at a moment when it just, you're able to see the things that it just does so masterfully. And that I, you know, I might not have noticed at a different time. And so it just completely rearranged the way that I thought about associate, you know, structuring poems and that sort of associative meander and orthogonal, you know, off at angles logic. And I remember writing all those poems and thinking, oh, these are so good. I'm so proud of myself. I'm writing the really the best poem, you know, blah, 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 right? That hubris that happens. And in fact, they turned out to be quite good. But a few years afterwards, you know, two or three years ago, I went back and I looked at those first drafts and they were just as mediocre as any random shitty first draft I've abandoned in the folder. Um, and I, but I think that in terms of revision process, you know, one of the things that I'm just sort of relentless about is just syntactical experimentation, like taking, you know, saving a million drafts so that I can screw things up over and over and over again. And like taking a line and trying to figure out how it can do something on the way to, you know, in there that there should be no direct statement because the line should be implying or inferring or mentioning that direct statement on the way to its true purpose, which is at least getting to the next line. Uh -huh. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, no, I can I can see that in in your in your work. The the syntax is thrilling. Oh, thank you. It's oh, like yeah. We feel like we're on a journey, at least when I, you know, I feel like I'm being carried along and it's so clear. Uh, so I mean, but it's tricky at the same time. Like I was just reading um, in, I was just reading in your book, Front Loading Syntax, <laughs> you know, and thinking about this, like this ever present problem that I think either you mentioned or somebody in class mentioned in response to it of, you know, you spend so much time thinking about syntax. Oh yes, of course you mentioned it a million times. You spend so much time thinking about syntax that you can lose sight of the underlying, you know, the content, right? And and I feel like that's the predicament that as one becomes increasingly sophisticated in their relationship, you, you know, that's the predicament is that the things that, you know, the white on white painting, the things that are in conversation, not with the broader world necessarily, but with this sort of hyper narrow. Mm -hmm. So I worry that I have started to do that in my most recent stuff. <laughs> so we can turn to uh, people's questions or comments. Um, yeah, Eileen has already, oh, Rihanna asked for more reading. Oh, that was a while back. A while back, okay, good. Um, anybody have questions or you can just unmute yourselves and uh, and ask them. We're not such a huge group. I mean, as I, I, I said in my email to Westminster friends and family, uh, I, I didn't want to make this reading a hundred people. Maybe that's selfish, but I think there's a, even through technology, there's a different energy when there's 79 black screens. <laughs> so 
So feel free, those of you who are here to unmute yourself and just speak up and ask a, a question or make a comment. I have plenty more if nobody said, nobody, nobody does this. I have a question about Octavio Paz. Um, such a, sorry, that took me by surprise that you mentioned him, um, especially because I was thinking about the, it kind of stuck, you know, thinking about Paz and it stuck with um, some of the words that you were, you were using, like, you know, compared to gravel, chimney, dust, hay, and, you know, you put in my head already um, Octavio Paz, and that's not what I think of when I think of him. <laughs> um, and of course, Octavio Paz is Octavio Paz, right? That's a major poet. But I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about that inspiration or that turn towards Paz. Oh, you know, probably not in a meaningful way. Um, <laughs> well, I'll just, I'll just intro, intro with that so that you're, you're not waiting for the... Um, so I think that, you know, I think in general, I am just kind of constantly a scavenger of possibility and, um, and had been reading an interview with him and that, so he had written about, you know, this, this, that I can't remember precisely right now, but he had written about traveling by train with his mother as a child and her putting his hand, her hand over his eyes so that he wouldn't see uh, you know, people hung from ropes from the, I think from trees or from poles outside the, along the tracks um, during the Civil War. And, you know, and I, uh, it, was a, it was a really striking image to me, but I don't think that I've earned my use of it, if that's what you're asking. <laughs> no, 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 I was just curious about that. But we do have a question from Paul. Um, the dead, the dead phrase in two poems, how do you take into account the potential association to Joyce's short story of this name? Oh, wait, which, what are, say more. Paul, do you wanna say a little more? You can unmute yourself, Paul. So in, in two of the poems that you uh, uh, recited tonight, uh, you had the phrase, the dead. Oh, and, and I'm afraid I can't hear the dead without, you know, the, the association to Joyce's, uh, you know, last poem in his Dubliner's book. Yeah. Oh, again, um, again, I have no, I have nothing to say quite in response to that. I actually haven't read the dead since college. Um, and so, uh, lo, the, the, overlaps of the world create too much create meaning where there is none okay thank you i'm always interested in how poets create a persona or self through which to write the autobiographical you you mentioned a lot of these poems are autobiographical can you talk about the difference between uh the self that is presented in the poems and the self that makes dinner and is talking to us now, perhaps? Oh, this, the, the actual self is, the, the, the poetic self is much cooler, um, much, much more like capable, competent, definitely respects deadlines, but probably doesn't have a life in which there are deadlines. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think it's also, you know, it's tricky in this kind of like, you know, American poetry maybe, maybe comes so directly out of confessionalism and especially, you know, being female or assigned female at birth, you like, there's this risk that what you're writing gets sort of uh, intermingled with, you know, gets, gets misconstrued as autobiographical when it's not. Um, but also, you know, this sort of the joy of poetry, I, you know, I feel like poetry is unique in the genres in that it, it allows the reader and author and speaker to sort of move between telling a truth that is recognizable to the reader, you know, or to the, to the reader, to the author, to the, you know, anybody with contextual knowledge, and seamlessly into telling a set of truths that have absolutely nothing to do with the real, real world, right? Um, 
what is my actual answer to this though? Well, uh, let, let me ask a follow-up question that, that, that you prompted and that is, do you think European poets, just generally European poets are less confessional, less autobiographical than Americans? I don't know. And I don't think that I'm well read enough to, <laughs> to, to say anything authoritative about it. I apologize. Difference. Um, but I, ha I also have not, have not figured out what it is, um, a, a difference in how they see the speaking self. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess for me, because I have, I, until probably, you know, five years ago, I really shied away from a, an autobiographical self. Um, I ended up writing things that I think were very much autobiographical in this really landscape-ish way, like very rooted in place and moment and texture and sensation, you know, things that somebody who knew me well would identify as having roots in a, a story. Uh -huh. And somebody who didn't would be none the wiser and it wouldn't make a difference uh -huh. because it because that story was not relevant to the poem so much as a way of fleshing out the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, folks, we have time for one or two more questions. Do you want to write them in the chat or? Hi, Miriam. I have a question about teaching. Oh, God. <laughs> It's a pretty simple question. I'm done. Uh, you remember him from the interview. Yeah. Hello. Um, so you've taught in Singapore and you've taught in the US. Uh, are there differences? I mean, this might be too broad, but are there or is there any difference between teaching in Singapore and the US? Are the students different or are the is the teaching culture different? Um Huh. You know, I feel like I feel like I have 12 hours to say about that. Well, for one, I think when I taught in Singapore, um, it was the first creative writing class that I think almost any of my students had ever taken. A few had taken community workshops. But other than that, they had had almost no context for self-expression that was um, that was guided and had critical rigor underpinning it. And so this experience of workshop and somebody saying, well, what is the, you know, like the, the sonic choices you're making, why are you doing that? Rather than, you know, it's, this sounds like it was about a really hard time in your life, right? <laughs> was, uh, you know, was, was a really new experience for them. And I think a lot of that comes from, you know, Singapore is 54 years old now. And, and I have never been in a place where the making of the national narrative was so close to the surface. You know, I think we see this everywhere all around us. I'm sure everybody everywhere, you know, sees this if they're looking for it, but especially because it was, I think, I think I was there on the, right after the 50th anniversary um, of, of becoming a nation state. And so like the newspaper would have these articles about the national narrative. It was, just so strange, you know, and so, and part of that national narrative is um, that Lee Kuan Yew, the prime minister, the sort of founder of the modern nation state of Singapore talked about the arts as a luxury we cannot afford. And I think that that inclination really underpins how Singaporeans think about and value the arts. Um, and, you know, that, this is a, on a huge tangent already, you know, and at the same time, because so much arts fun funding is channeled through the government, it also means that it's really hard for people to write weird shit, you know, because they, because this sense of the surveillance culture that's so ever present in Singapore is also really kind of deeply shapes what are, how, what types of arts and what types of presentations are, you know, elevated and what are not. Um, and so it makes it really hard for people to speak out about things or to write, you know, write narratives that I think here would nobody would think twice about. Uh, I don't think that answered your question. I'm sure I have an answer to circle back around to sometime or another. <laughs> no, you did. It was very insightful. 
Um, I, on my most recent flight back from Nepal, where my parents live and where I grew up, I had a layover in Singapore and it was completely accidental because there was a flight delay and they put me up in a hotel and a very fancy for two, three days. I really enjoyed it on the surface. Uh, it's very superficial, but it felt like a very closed society and so I was wondering how that would translate into a workshop right. yeah yeah but I mean I, you I, answered your question but yeah I do think you know I think that the students in the workshop were you know really excited to push themselves and trying and to try new things and because of my particular you know like uh training or what you know, my reading or whatever we read a lot of we read almost entirely American poetry and on one hand, you know, the other thing I'll say is that in Singapore, if you are a serious artist and you're 22 or 23 and you want to publish a book, you can publish a book at that age, you know, or 24, 25, you know. And so by the time you're like my age, you might have like seven or eight books and be like, a, you know, internationally known in the region. Right. And yet, you know, and yet I think I think that's really fantastic, but it also, I think it also is kind of has this complicated other side in that there's not quite as much rigor because there's this sense that like the literary world and the arts are not important. So it's fine to, you know, might as well, you might as well publish when you're 23 and, and you've arrived at a perfect manuscript for the first moment. Well, I have a question. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. I'm never sure. Uh, one of the blurbs uh, described you as a fieldwork uh, based practice, I think. Um, what kind of fieldwork do you do, and how does that enter into your poetry? Oh, um, so for the past, well, for the past, I want to say, few years, but this is becoming kind of a misnomer. Um, I'd when I when I wrote in the volcano's mouth, I started think I it, so much of it was about my my sort of years of recreational vagrancy, um, you know, hitchhiking and hopping trains around the United States and hitchhiking in the uh, other uh, around the world, and. I start, you know, I started thinking of that kind of casually when I first started writing about it as this kind of like retrospective field work. Um, this, you know, this exploratory process of writing about these kind of American, homegrown American migrants. Um, and then as I, you know, as that book was coming together in my mind on paper or whatever, I started also, you know, I was just like, this is sorry, I'm just giving the backstory and I don't actually need to that led into um, thinking about, le well, learning about um, the Hong Kong's Chungking mansions, which are kind of really changing right now. Sorry, I hear this echo in the other room of my sweetheart who's listening in, <laughs> and it's distracting. Um, anyway, so so I started re I started researching the Chungking mansions, which in those days, in those days, merely like almost a decade ago, were this kind of intercultural nexus of the low end global economy, a place where people from all over the developing world of you know, developing countries of Africa and Asia and the Middle East would come often primarily to do business with the um, with the manufacturing zones of southern China. Um, and I started thinking, oh, this is so cool. You know, I'm so interested in you know, I, start, I started inchoately thinking, this is so interesting and I would love to spend some time working, you know, working on this and in, in this context. And, you know, and so was it, ended up going there and working with a lot of people doing interviews with economic migrants and asylum seekers um, and getting to know a lot of people. And on you know, occasional Friday nights, I still join um, a class of asylum seekers that's run by an anthropology professor at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, although we've all kind of dispersed, a lot of people have been resettled, a lot see the writing on the wall with Hong Kong as China's kind of draconian um, 
new laws are handed down that mean both that they will have so much less ability to speak out as refugees advocating for themselves, but also um, that, you know, they're just not going to get refugee staff. Like they're just in terms of their chances in Hong Kong to be resettled somewhere else. Hong Kong doesn't take refugees, they just resettle. But even then their chances, they're just totally fucked. And so, <laughs> to, you know, and so um, anyway, so I sit in on this class in which we all kind of, it's, it's ostensibly an English class. We all read the newspaper and debate, ar argue about politics. Um, and it's, it's a lot of fun. And so I've been working on a book of poems drawn from the past five years of a lot of these friendships and and sort of more formalized interviews and field work. Um, and yet it's also one of these projects that I feel the more I have, the more I have thought about it and worked on it, the, the less confident in it I feel because it just demands so much. It demands so much more than poetry alone can offer. And it also just demands both the sort of ethical rigor of writing on behalf of writing in the voice of these people who you know who are collaborators to some degree in in any moment that their experiences are voiced um, but I, I think also just that sort of liminal space of not even being a refugee but being an asylum seeker so being a petitioner waiting for your case to be granted refugee status and petitioning over and over and over again is sort of so poorly understood that I, I sort of feel like uh, maybe someday I'll finish this, you know, and meanwhile, there's so much change in Hong Kong right now um, that I think by the time I have finished it, the book will be kind of an artifact of another era. <laughs> Thank you. It's very indirect of me. You look like an album cover, by the way, the sort of black square in the background. <laughs> That's the fault of my computer. Okay, well, we have, we have reached the end of our time together. Um, I will stop recording, uh, but we can hang on and, uh, oh no, actually before we, uh, before I stop recording, do you wanna unmute yourselves and, and clap? <laughs> So Miriam doesn't feel like it's just some kind of, you know, abyss out there. Thank you so much, dear abyss.